Hello, and welcome to another installment of Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast slash radio show about the Beatles, everything about them as a group, soloists, past, present, future, if we can figure it out. I'm Alan Cozen, and I'm joined by my three co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. How are you doing? Good, Alan. How are you doing? Pretty good. And Steve Marinucci, whose work everyone knows from his examiner columns. He's the Beatles examiner and probably the monkeys examiner, are you? And, uh... Yes, yeah, absolutely. I Actually, I am. But hello, everyone. Hey, Steve. So, uh, and last but certainly not least, Al Sussman, longtime contributor and executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine and general Beatles person about town, the town <laughs> being someplace in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> We're all over the place. I'm in Portland, Maine. Ken's in Connecticut. Steve is on the West Coast. And today we're going to talk about two of Paul's sort of oldies albums, the so-called Russian album, also so-called back in the USSR, uh, has a Russian title, which I believe is pronounced Snova BCCCP. Snova BCCCP. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I think they pronounce it Snova, but. Uh, Snova? I, wow, okay. Been, yeah, it's been a long time since I had a Russian person walk me through that. And then uh, Run Devil Run. They're a little more than a decade apart. Uh, two sort of interesting looks at the things that inspired Paul as he was uh, sort of a formative, a, for, a beetle in formation. But we also wanted to take note along the way of the passing of Terry Wogan. And uh, Steve, do you want to bring us up to date on that? Well, I I did a a story yesterday, Sunday, uh, because this this is Monday the 1st, about his – some of his interviews uh, that he'd done. I mean he'd done – you know, uh, he talked to – well, uh, from what I could find, uh, Paul, Ringo, and George um, over the years, and Cynthia Lennon, and you know, he he basically they basically came on his show to promote things. Um, Paul uh, significantly came on uh, to his show one time, and and um, just before the band, uh, they went out on the New World tour, and he did My Brave Face and Figure of Eight. Another time, he came on and did All My Trials, which uh, was not, which caused a Political commotion in in the United in the UK, and it, and it, as a matter of fact, it it happened just before uh, Margaret Thatcher um, got uh, tossed out of office, as he, as Paul mentioned in the interview that he did. George was on um, talking about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, induction for the Beatles, and and we should also... we should say that he, this was on the BBC, right? Right, or, or right, the, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. This was not. These were not shown in America, and, and there are clips uh, in the story I wrote um, from YouTube um, that uh, have little bits of the the interviews. And Ringo was on in uh, I guess 2010, and uh, he talked about uh, the he talked about the Beatles actually, and he also talked about the autograph controversy, which had happened I guess shortly before that. Um, you know, and why he decided to stop doing autographs. But I mean, they basically went. It was basically a a talk show, and um, Wogan was very, you know, was very folksy. He was good, you know, he wasn't the real, he wasn't the kind of guy that celebrities kind of feared. But he would occasionally ask, um, you know, um, newsy type questions. Um, but uh, he's a institution. He was an institution in the UK. Um, that's the significant part um there were a lot of tributes that i saw yesterday uh from a lot of people i did not have not seen anything from ringo or or paul yet um and i'm actually kind of surprised that they haven't responded but um and that may probably will change by the time this show comes on uh comes on the air but um he was but wogan was a was a big deal in the uk he was uh uh, I'm not sure who you would want to compare him to here because that there's really not a there's not too many national talk shows anymore outside of the political political ones and that's not what he did. But he had a broadcasting career of about 50 years, right? And actually um, spent a lot of time in radio. 
had his own radio program, and he was extremely popular. Just the mere fact that Paul McCartney in particular appeared on his show several times tells you something. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very sad loss. The thing is, for Beatle fans and the rest of the world, especially those who are collectors, you know, it's, it was a thrill to actually see some of these interviews that you wouldn't normally get to see here. Mm-hmm. And very often there are times when the Beatles themselves would do interviews in England when they weren't promoting themselves much in the rest of the world. And, and Terry Wogan was one of those people that was able to interview Paul, George, and Ringo. So that's very impressive right there, and Cynthia Lennon. Mm-hmm. So. Okay. And perhaps we should just acknowledge in passing, it's not really Beatles-connected, but it's sort of their world-connected in a way. Uh, the passing a few days ago of both Paul Kantner and Sidney Anderson, the first mm-hmm. singer for the Jefferson mm-hmm. Airplane, yeah. on the same day. Yeah, so, that, was, yeah. That, was, that was really scary. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's uh, spooky. That was sad. that was very sad. Yeah, and and Sidney Anderson really kind of got you know in the uh, in the aftermath of Grace Slick, nobody really paid a whole lot of attention to her. But she that one vocal on Chauffeur Blues that she sang on the uh, first album was really really good, really good. Mm-hmm. By the way, Julian was on w- with Wogan too. By the way, mm-hmm. uh, I as a, I see, but uh, I don't know that there I, I don't know that there are any clips. There may be, but. And actually, you, Steve, you posted a picture of Paul with Paul Kantner, right. Paul McCartney with Paul Kantner, mm-hmm. and your McCalkinen, mm-hmm. right. and then you got the story behind that. Yeah, well, that, that picture's been around, but I, through Matt Hurwitz, we got some information on it, where exactly uh, the picture was taken and and when. Um, the when wasn't really that hard because, you know, uh, the Paul's trip. Uh, to the West Coast had been documented, but the where was more interesting. And as a matter of fact, as I wrote up on the thing I, I put up yesterday um, on Fell Street in San Francisco, I've passed, I've driven on Fell Street many times. Um, a, um, a favorite record store that uh, Alan may be familiar with um, that used to be in San Francisco, it's no longer there now, um, was uh, one that I used to drive to Fell Street to get to. But anyway. That's neither here nor there, um, but um, yeah. So yeah, that was kind of that was sad, and uh, uh, I'm I, I I do like the airplane a lot. They're they're not just the Grace Slick stuff, but uh, yeah. they were great, they were a great band. they were a great man. And Ken, you were pointing out that uh, just shortly after our show last week on uh, Beatlesque performers uh there were there was some some follow-up there that you wanted to mention yeah it's pretty ironic that um the day after we finished recording our show on beatles music i saw this article online from our very own alan haber who runs pure pop radio that runs our show and um we were talking about emmett rhodes in our show and i did say something to the effect that i heard that he was working on a brand new album don't know when it's coming out well Alan knew all the information. There's a new album coming out from Emmett, and it's due out February the 26th. It's called Rainbow Ends. We talked about Emmett because of uh, the similarities in his music to Paul McCartney, especially his first solo album, which was just called Emmett Rhodes, where he played all the musical instruments, and the songs sound very McCartney-esque. The instrumentation, all the different parts, very McCartney-esque. Anyway, so the new album is coming out February 26th, and also... We mentioned the band Jellyfish in that show. Well, Roger Manning from the band and Jason Faulkner, who also played in Jellyfish and also on Paul McCartney's Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, they're on the album with Emmett Rhodes. Mm. So is Susanna Hoffs mm. from the Bangles, who we could have talked about in the Beatles show, but we didn't. Mm. And uh, some of the members of Brian Wilson's band. Huh. So... Um, yeah, it's something to look forward to. Those of us who have been waiting, this is his first new album, and I think, uh, what was it, 40, something like 45 years, oh. I think. Mm-hmm. Well, sounds interesting. And Roger Manning's going to be in the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. I don't think that's... Yeah. <laughs> okay, so turning to our two Paul McCartney albums, let's, uh, let's look at them chronologically, um, starting with the Russian album, um, which, for those of you who tuned in late into the Paul McCartney story. Uh, he 
recorded in 1987 at uh, basically auditions for the band that became the 1989 touring band. Had people come in and play uh, a bunch of oldies with him because these were things everybody knew and you know didn't take a lot of prep, didn't need to be taught to anyone. And then I think he liked the tape so much that he decided that uh, as a gesture – um, after uh, Glasnost began uh, and things were opening up in, in the USSR that, that he would put out initially just in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was still the Soviet Union in those days. Uh, so, you know, the tracks include, you know, lots of uh, significant things like 20 Flight Rock, which he, uh, you know, basically... I guess it's the tune that in a, in a way got him into the Beatles uh, that he played at the uh, Woolton Fett for John. And uh, I think John was impressed that he knew all the lyrics. I'm in love again. Bring it on home to me. Um, a Duke Ellington song. You don't get a, don't get around much anymore uh, in a great Rocky arrangement. That's all right. Mama summertime, the Gershwin song. So let's start with Steve. Steve, what were your impressions of the, the record when it came out well i remember the i remember there was a long time before we even got to hear it i mean we heard about the album in america quite a while before we actually got to hear it and i think there was as i recall there was a lot of speculation or at least the initial feeling was we weren't going to get to hear it but we finally we finally finally did i mean they finally there were i remember seeing vinyl copies that Beetlefest and and there were boo I think boo the bootlegs actually were first. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. There were bootlegs first before it finally came out, and then he finally they finally released it on CD. I don't uh, uh, I I think it was re- actually released on vinyl, but then it finally came out on CD too. Um, In 1991, it looks like. right. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it took a long time for it to get here. That was and I and and. And well, of course, if you the... lived on the West Coast, Steve. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am. Um, you know, can I, if I can interject. Um, oh. When I when I had heard that this thing was coming out, um, strangely enough, I had a friend who was a ballet conductor, who was going on a trip to Russia, and he he called me up. I mean, it was very shortly after the the record was released in Russia, and he said, "Is there anything I can bring you back?" And I said, "Well." As a matter of fact, uh, and mm-hmm. I told him about the album, and I told him that you know if he was smart, he'd bring back a case of the things, and he did. And um, I believe he made a, a small fortune um, uh, selling them through a uh, mainly a bootleg shop in New York. He, he basically just sort of unloaded them all, you know, to them. And um, so he had brought me back the first version. There were actually three two or three vinyl versions of this with a couple of track differences and some different color covers and things. And uh, so he brought back the first one and the first edition and said it really wasn't hard to find. You know, people were selling him on the street. Um, (laughs) And I basically at that time brought it into my editor and said, look at this. And, uh, you know, for, for us, it was a, an interesting story because Beatles stuff had been bootlegged in Russia because it had officially been banned as, you know, sort of, you know, Western capitalist lackey kind of middle class music or something, whatever the Russians had to say at the time. And so people would smuggle it in. Um, And eventually Melodia, the Russian record company, which put out the McCartney album, um, eventually Melodia started putting out some Beatles tracks and Beatles compilations in Russia, but they were basically pirated. They, they were not, I think, official releases. Mm. Uh, so we sort of like the idea that, you know, here uh, the Russians have had to deal with bootleg Beatles stuff all the time just to hear any Beatles. And now in America, we were sort of scrambling to hear this McCartney album. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so yeah, but uh, yeah. here in New York, uh, no, I'd say here in New York, I'm New York anymore, but in New York, um, if you knew where to go, you could get them actually pretty early. <laughs> well, matter of, matter of fact, yeah. I have a specific memory about, about that that in fact involves Ken and our friend Tom Francione mm. because uh, Tom and I guested on Ken's show – I think this is like the this uh, like the end of year in 87 
And if I'm remembering correctly, Ken, correct me if if uh, if I've got the story wrong. Tom had got had just gotten a copy of the it, album. I think for, it would have been the end of '88. Oh, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, the end of '88. Uh, he would have just gotten a copy of it and had it for us for the year that end of year show. Hmm. Well, I actually don't remember that, but that would make sense yeah. because Tom always got everything ahead exactly. of me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. still does. <laughs> he may well have gotten one of the copies that my friend brought back. Could very um, well be. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we did our story on it, I, I know, on, in mid-January 89. And the reason it took us a few weeks to get it going is because we kept thinking we were going to get a Paul McCartney interview about it. And... Um, Basically, there was just a lot of back and forth with his office, and it never finally happened. And finally, my editor said, just write it. Just write it without him. Mm-hmm. So I did. But we, we were sort of curious about, you know, if he would talk about what his reasons were and, and all of that. But that didn't happen. So back to you, Steve. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, once I finally got to hear this, I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. Um, it's raw enough. I mean, it's not... It's not uh, your typical McCartney album. It's not, you know, really polished. He also didn't stick with all the obvious songs. There, there's a, a number of obscure songs in there that, I mean, that's really good. Um, you know, I mean, he the Don't Get Around Much Anymore is, has always been one of my favorite McCartney songs because of the fact, number one, it doesn't sound like a Duke Ellington song. Right, and I think, and that that's pretty that's pretty cool, and and it's also a great song. It's a great tune, um, mm-hmm. but he did a fantastic version to that, uh, just wonderful version. You know, uh, um, the Fats Domino songs were were really good. It was good to hear him do twenty twenty fly rock. This one is just a it's just a great it's just a great uh, album all the way. You know, just about all the way through. Mm-hmm. It, it really is. I mean, he did a he did a fantastic job. Um, I, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, for all the times that you have to, you know, you criticize Paul for being too slick and and you know not uh, getting down and rocking with it. I mean, he really he really did with this. And so there yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, that was one of the things about it. It was loose, and it was loose in the best way because it was. <laughs> It was really good musicians jamming on tunes they'd been playing all their lives, you know. Mm-hmm. So, mm. um, Al, you know, it's interesting. I for for some reason I was initially a little bit disappointed in the album, only because I felt that it wasn't raw. Um, it it was it wasn't more of a raw rock and roll album, knowing the fact that Paul is a you know he's he's a first generation unreconstructed rock and roller as well as a devotee of other types of music. But I would have thought that it would have rocked out a little bit more. Yeah. It's almost as if there was there was maybe even a little bit more of a uh of an r and b maybe even perhaps uh new orleans perhaps rockabilly feel to it than just you know raw slam bam rock and roll but it's uh uh it's interesting you know you, you look at the track listing and his Paul's devotion to Elvis really comes out in not only in this album but also run devil run because mm-hmm. you've got his mm. uh you've got you know Elvis's first record that's all right mama you've got um uh just because which is a uh, um uh, actually a country tune that Elvis covered during uh during the sun era as uh, as well as I'm looking th- as well as Lordy Lordy Miss Claudy, which actually of course had been a hit for an R and B hit for Lloyd Price, but Elvis recorded it in 1956. Mm-hmm. So obviously that would have made a big impression on uh, on the young Paul. So so certainly his devotion to Elvis is very much uh, very much uh, present here, uh, as is his devotion to Fats Domino. Because you've mm-hmm. got I'm in love again. You've got I'm gonna be a wheel someday. 
you know, both of which were uh, major hits for Fats. You've got uh, the, the Midnight Special, which is actually, if I'm remembering correctly, was a bonus track on the CD, mm-hmm. which is, of course, an old blues song, as is uh, Cracking Up, which was, um, is it? Bo Diddley. Bo Diddley, yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Thank yeah. you. So it's so it's it's very it's a very eclectic collection, but to me it just didn't didn't seem to rock out as much as I think I would have I would have liked originally, but uh, but that's just you know that's just did one it grow minute. on you over the years? It um, to some extent, but uh, as we'll talk about a little bit later, I still like Run Devil Run a lot more. Okay, hmm. Ken. Hmm. <laughs> This is an interesting conversation. Um, actually, uh, when this album first came out, I liked it. But I was, I've always kind of treated the albums that were all cover versions, like John's Rock and Roll. I never, I don't want to say I, I liked it less, but I never gave it the consideration as I would the original material. It was almost like a bit of a disappointment that it's not an album with all original material. But as time has gone on and you learn the history of the Beatles, especially through the work of Mark Lewison, because when he put out his first book, The Beatles Live, and that was a book that I used to devour because I love looking at the the track listing of the songs they used to do in their early years that they never released. And there's so much great music that the Beatles loved from the 50s and early 60s and even pre-rock and roll that they never got around to recording as a group, whether it was for Parlophone or whether... Well, they did a lot on BBC Radio. Thank God we have those recordings. Right. Mm-hmm. But outside of that and Tony Sheridan stuff and the Star Club, if you look at what Mark had written in The Beatles Live, many of the songs that they were doing from 57, 1957 on turned up on the Russian album mm-hmm. and Run, Devil, Run, and also on John's Rock and Roll album. Mm-hmm. And... One of the things that I, I really appreciate, and Al, you were just talking about this, we just did a show on black influences. Right. And we mentioned Fats Domino a lot, but the Beatles, for Parlophone, never recorded a Fats Domino song. Right. And uh, yes, Lady Madonna was written in, in the Fats Domino vein, and Fats went on to cover it, but they never did cover Fats, they never did cover Elvis Presley for Parlophone. But thank God they did on BBC Radio. Yes. <laughs> you know, and also Paul McCartney did it, uh, you know, on these albums, these two albums. And John would do Hound Dog Live, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a couple of artists there that were not represented, certainly in the Parlophone catalog from the Beatles, but you have them on both these albums. But um, I was a little bit surprised when the Russian album came out because when I did listen to it, it was very loose, as you said, Alan, and I wasn't used to that from Paul. Mm. He has put out raw albums. I would consider Wildlife very raw. Mm-hmm. Even some of the, like, Red Rose Speedway, to me, is a bit raw. The first McCartney album is raw. It doesn't have that polish to it. So there have been times when he's put out raw stuff, but this had a looseness to it. It's almost like you were walking in on a rehearsal. You were walking in on a and, rehearsal. Mm-hmm. In a way, you know, it was an audition. So that's yeah, why it but, had that sound, you know. So some people like that. And over the years, I've really come to love the Russian album. Uh, well, you know, you mentioned the word eclectic, Al, and that's what Paul McCartney has always been, even in this case. Exactly. Because you've got, a, you've got a song like Cracking Up, which to me is sort of almost reggae-ish, I think, in its arrangement. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, taking Don't Get Around Much Anymore and rocking that out. And I, I do love that arrangement a lot. You know, uh, Summertime doing a slow version of that song, the George Gershwin classic, which the Beatles used to do. They used to do yeah. Summertime Live. And in fact, that, fact that, that one among the you know relatively few remaining Holy Grail recordings is that one that they did backing Lou Walter um, in right. Germany. And you, know, you listen to this and you wonder, is it, is it an arrangement similar to this? And it may have been. Mm-hmm. Just before doing this show, just for the heck of it, I took the Mark Lewison book out, The Beatles Live, and I just wrote down a list of the songs the Beatles used to do that ended up on either the Russian album, Run Devil Run, or John's Rock and Roll album that they didn't release as the Beatles. Mm-hmm. So very quickly, I thought I'd just read off this list. All Shook Up, they used to do, right. Elvis's song. Uh, Be Bopalula. Uh-huh. Blue Mood of Kentucky I put in there since, since Paul did that uh, on Unplugged. Right. Boney Maroney, Laudy Miss Claudie, The Midnight Special, 
No Other Baby, which he also rehearsed during the Russian album as well. Mm -hmm. Peggy Sue, Summertime, uh, 20 Flat Rock. Also Honey Hush, um, It's Now or Never. Um, yeah, those are the ones right there. So it gives you an idea of some of the other material the Beatles used to do. And obviously, when you hear this stuff as well as John's rock and roll album, you get a feel for what were their favorites, some of their favorites. There's no way that the Beatles, when they were cranking out two albums a year and they wanted to put a lot of their own original material in there in their early years, they couldn't they couldn't give you every song they loved from the 50s sure. and the early 60s. So, you know, that's why I treasure the Russian album now, as well as Run, Devil, Run, because you get a feel for more of what they loved, you know, as uh, from from that particular era. And now I like the fact that you know, if you go through McCartney's entire catalog, you do have some raw albums. You've certainly got very polished albums. And then if you really want something that's relaxed and raw, you know, and it's just Paul with a band, loose, this is the album for you. Yeah. If you wanted to just, you know, walk in on a recording session and, and listen to Paul with a band live, if you want a take that's a good take, it may not be the perfect take, but it's certainly good enough. Mm -hmm. That's what this album comes across as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, the difference between this album and some of the other ones that you described as raw, you know, McCartney and Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway, for instance, is that those were really studio productions in a way, even though McCartney, the first album was a home studio production, but it was, you know, overdubbing and carefully constructing and all of that. And this is a band playing in a room. Um and that I think is a big difference and it, it has that feel, you know, mm. and I think that's, that's one of the things that makes it so good for me. I mean, it, it has the quality of, as you say, walking in on a rehearsal, which consequently gives it pretty much the quality of a bootleg. And as we know, bootlegs are the zenith of Western Civ. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, that could be why I like it. They so. are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Of course they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a feeling of off the cuffness, let's say, you know. Yeah. Um he had I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have had any idea of releasing this in any form when the sessions took place. And he probably just recorded them so that since he was putting the band together, he could review the performances later and decide who, you know, who we would want to come back. I would love to hear the rest of the tapes from these sessions, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's very possible that with every different group of, of musicians that he brought together, there, there are alternate versions of some of these things that may be quite different, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I would like to say one thing, and that is, of all the covers that Paul has done in his solo career, one of my absolute favorites, I love when he did Just Because on this album. Mm -hmm. It really, you know, it's got that Elvis feel. Yeah. And I love when Paul does Elvis. And he didn't he didn't really do that, you know, in the Beatles. Yeah. Which is something that always baffled me, uh, you know, in the Beatle years, why they never covered an Elvis Presley song for Parlophone. Mm -hmm. You know, and you could have all your different theories as to why. But if Elvis, as John Lennon said before Elvis, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. If they really felt that way, they never did cover an Elvis song for that catalog. Yeah. Yeah, I think, but like I, I said, thank God we got the BBC stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think maybe they were just intimidated uh, about recording stuff by Elvis because, especially at, at that point in the mid '60s, it wasn't that long after after Elvis's rise. It was only about eight years after mm. after he had really after his you know a r initial smash. Yeah, in, in 1956, uh, and I, I, I think maybe. They were, in a sense, intimidated that they would, you know, they kind of preferred to do things by maybe lesser, lesser known people like Arthur Alexander, uh, yeah. you know, things like yeah. that. Uh, I don't, I don't, than, or intimidated right? or not, I think they were making their own way. They were, they were making their own name and the goal was to be bigger than Elvis. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, 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 yeah, because I was going to say, I, I don't think it was intimidation. I think it was competition. Mm -hmm. I think that's really what it was. I mean, they didn't want to, you know, uh, doing Elvis at the at that time would have been, you know, like, you know, trying to give him a boost. And, and he was really, and I think 
they they both had a sense that they you know they were comp- they were competing against each other. I mean, look look at what happened when they when they met in Los Angeles. I mean, that was it wasn't. I don't know if that was really the friendliest meeting according to various accounts. You know, there was a little bit of there was a little bit of every. I mean, everybody was kind of watching everybody else. I mean, they weren't all. Uh, it took him some time to get started playing and stuff like that. But I, I, I think it was more competition than anything else. That well, they certainly didn't mind doing his material for BBC Radio, yeah. and there you got heard on the That's radio. True. Well, that was a different and situation, that was... though, because they weren't famous. I mean, they weren't as I should say. They weren't. You know, I mean, depending on when they did it on on BBC Radio, they were either they hadn't really broken through, or they were just break. They had just, you know, I, I think that's a different situation. Um, and in addition, this was a radio performance that they envisioned as being just heard in England and not being heard again. You know, yeah. just live on the radio. Exactly. And it, yeah, so it was a different thing mm-hmm. than making a record and releasing it internationally, you know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Okay, but at the same time, you could say that in England, when they were doing That's All Right, Mama mm-hmm. on BBC Radio, they were the biggest band in England at that point. That's true. Mm-hmm. They just weren't international, that's all. Right. But, um, you know. And they were playing please, it. Please, please be. They were playing it to some degree for an audience, some of which, some of whom may have heard them play it live in their early days, too. Yeah. So it mm-hmm. wasn't that different. You know, that audience heard a different Beatles than we heard in, in a certain way. You know, they mm-hmm. heard them as a cover band much more than we did. Um, mm-hmm. And they may have been, I don't know, they may have been mindful of all this stuff or it may be completely coincidental. Who knows what they were thinking. Right, and they also did. They also did. I forgot to remember to forget on BBC Radio, and yeah. that was fairly late. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in their BBC recordings, right. wasn't that sixty four? Sixty four, yeah, and and, and I think I think that's all right, Mama. It was also from sixty four. No, sixty three. Oh, okay, sixty three. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so mindful of the ticking clock, perhaps we should move on to Run Devil Run. Okay. And um, I thought maybe Al, if you wanted to talk about the genesis of the album and you know why he did this and how he got the band together, who's in it, that kind of thing. Well, it's it's real interesting because this was actually the first professional project that Paul did following Linda McCartney's death. Right. It was uh, roughly a little little over about a year and a half, actually about after after Linda's death and he uh, it's interesting there uh the band that he uses on on this album the the only holdover from the band that uh, that he used for the uh, the Russian album was uh the guitarist Mick Green mm-hmm. 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 but in a you know but in addition though on this album he's got David Gilmore Right, and, mm-hmm. he's got, and he's got Ian Pace, and he's got Pete Wingfield, and you know it's it, uh, it was a, a real kick-ass rock and roll band, and mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. in fact uh, Gilmore particularly kind of sublimated his you know his more Pink Floydian techniques to really put in a you know a, a kick-ass rock and roll performance and that's to me that's the difference in this album uh it's it's very much a kick out the jams rock and roll album much uh you know even if you look look at the material again uh you know the elvis covers all shook up and uh and party and i got stung and i got stung, I got stung. And I got stung. exactly the uh yeah. Uh, the song I couldn't think of a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, and yes, and even Brown Eyed Handsome Man, which Elvis uh, covered, but which is a, a Chuck Berry song, which everybody else in the world had covered as well. Mm-hmm. But uh, but also you've got you know uh, Larry Williams, she said yeah. You've got uh, Blue Jean Bop, which is uh, Gene Vincent and the Blue Caps, one of the you know one of the early probably one of the probably one of the earliest uh, songs in the in the Beatles in the Beatles repertoire. Mm-hmm. You know well not the, well, I guess at that point they were still the, the Quarry Men and um, and no other baby from the you know the skiffle uh the skiffle mm-hmm. era uh right. 
the, the Vipers did. Yeah, it. exactly. The Vi- which had been produced by George Martin, which says mm-hmm. we that just recently. Um, but also there is kind of a, a little bit of a, you know, melancholy overtone to it because mm-hmm. one of the songs uh, included is Lonesome Town, which is, mm-hmm. which, the, which was a Rick Nelson hit. And right. uh, that was, uh, according to Paul, it was very much a song that, uh, that he and Linda had loved. There are uh, three originals, and one of them is called uh, "Try Not to Cry," and uh, and the other one, the uh, well, the, the the title song, of course, um, uh, "Run Devil Run," but um, uh, it's uh, there is a little bit of a of a of a melancholy feel to some of the tracks on the album, but most of it though is is really kick out the jams rock and roll and uh as i said i've always kind of liked this album better although there is also uh much like on the russian album there is a uh there's an old uh uh gem from the you know from the 30s coquette which was a uh from the the guy lombardo uh songbook uh but most of it though is uh is pretty much uh flat out rock and roll and for that reason and the talents of the band uh, involved, that's why I've always kind of preferred this to uh, uh, to the Russian album. Mm. Mm. And actually, Coquette was a, a Fats Domino recording. Right. Oh, and yes. Paul liked the Paul liked it. It was it was one of his B sides, so that's how he knew the song. Ah, uh, yes, okay. And perhaps there was a slight bit of poaching into George Harrison territory with Moving Mag, Carl Perkins. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, very much right. so. Well, they all loved Carl Perkins. Yeah. yeah. So, and and Paul did work with Carl. Sure. He took a Vore album, and so yes, that's true. Know. That's true. Um, so let's go out of order. Ken next. Uh, Run Devil Run is an album that I uh, that I've always loved. Um, it is very edgy, very polished, and it is also eclectic too. And again, I just love knowing that these are favorites of Paul's, and he has a habit of. Mixing familiar songs with less familiar songs. And um, Al, you just mentioned Lonesome Town, mm-hmm. which is one of my all time favorite Rick Nelson yeah. songs. And just the fact that he covered Rick Nelson. Yes. The Beatles never, the Beatles never talked about Rick right. Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, it's just, um, you know, and I, lo- I love his vocals on Lo- yeah. Lonesome yes. Town. He actually sings it like an octave higher than Rick did mm-hmm. uh, on the hit version. And, um, you know, Blue Jean Bop is a lot of fun. Get a little bit of that rockabilly in there. <laughs> she said, yeah, really kicks ass. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, and um, All Shook Up is a, is a very different arrangement also from the way that Elvis did it. Mm-hmm. The original songs that Paul did, I love. And the fact that he they're not just original songs, but he tried to write them in a 50s style. Yes. So Run Devil Run, he did say he tried to write as a Chuck Berry type song. And it does have that Chuck Berry kind of feel to it. There's a song in there, one of his originals is an absolute favorite of mine called What It Is. Yeah. That song really, that's another one that, that kicks butt mm-hmm. right there. Yep. And uh, I love when he does a song that just starts immediately with vocals, you know, and there's so much energy in that song. Um, you know, that that's one of my favorite, and there's so many great rockers from Paul's career, but that's, that's one of my favorites right there. Um, doing Coquette. Again, that's a B-side in his mind. A Fats Domino B-side. Mm-hmm. The arrangement that he did to Brown Eyed Handsome Man is more of a um, uh, Cajun type feel to it. So, you know, th- just the fact that they put some work into it and did something different than the way that Chuck Berry did it. Mm-hmm. You know, I love that uh, party really rocks. I got stung. It's just it's it's really electric that version there. You know, the whole thing overall. I love the fact that um, this band really rocks. And when you've seen footage of them and and alan you can talk about this because you saw paul at the cavern with this band Mm -hmm. this band really cooks yeah and not to say anything about the band that he's had now for the past 15 years but i certainly would have loved to have seen him tour with a band like this one yeah so um you know i I saw him on a british tv show doing honey hush which is another song Mm -hmm. that's a great rocker on here and my God, I mean, this is this is Paul rocking, mm-hmm. and his voice is in tip-top shape for rockers. And uh, you know, it just seems like 
whenever Paul needs to recharge his batteries for whatever the reason, the best way to do that is to go back and do 50s rock and roll. It seems to be, maybe that was part of why they did a lot of 50s rock during the Let It Be sessions. Mm -hmm. Including Honey Ush, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. I'm sure sure a lot of these songs from the Russian album and Run, Devil, Run, the Beatles rehearsed during Let It Be, too. So, uh, you know, I love this album. I love the contrast between the Russian album and and Run, Devil, Run. And also, we should make mention of the fact that Chris Thomas co-produced this album with Paul. Right. And it seems like whenever Paul wants an edge in his music, like Chris Thomas also co-produced Back to the Egg, Mm -hmm. he calls on Chris Thomas. Right. So um, they did a great job on this. And even um, when the single came out for... um, was it No Other Baby or Try Not to Cry? There was a bonus track, Fabulous. Yes, yeah. Charlie Gracie. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. What a great song. Yeah. <laughs> and a great version. Right. 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 Apart from that, there weren't many um, outtakes or B-sides that have emerged. Unlike, you know, there were, there were more that came out after the Russian album that, you know, mm. ended up on the backs of Japanese mm-hmm. singles and things. But And, and then I think got compiled onto the... To the American CD, but there there wasn't an awful lot of extra stuff for mm-hmm. Run Devil Run. Mm-hmm. And you know what else on Run Devil Run? A lot of the songs are short. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like two minutes or two and a half minutes, and it kind of harkens back to the old days when those songs were really short songs, and that's what was part of the appeal when they were hits on the radio uh, or when the Beatles heard them, because you know you're really into a song and then the song ends and you want to hear it over and over mm-hmm. again. You might feel that there are certain times when maybe a Beatle covers a song and it goes on too long. These songs really are kind of closer to, you know, the way that it was done back then. In fact, there was a version that came out of Run, Devil, Run that was all in mono. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think Paul had that feel, had that vibe going on. And uh, it's one of the many reasons why why I love Run, Devil, Run. Mm -hmm. High energy, high energy album right there. Very much so. This may be the the mono stuff. I've actually never played them, but um, when I went to Liverpool for the concert, there were were lots of shops around Matthew Street um, with tons of Beatles stuff. And one of the things that I picked up there was he put this album out as a series of 45s that came packaged in one of those old kind of record cases that people used to keep their singles in. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that was, that was sort of a, a fun little piece, you know, but, um, so Steve, I, I also, uh, like this album a lot. I think if I had to give an edge though, I think I'd give the edge to the Russian, album just for a little more um looseness there are a couple of tracks on here that just don't seem as loose as as the entire uh, as what was on the russian album but overall i mean you know uh you know she said yeah is is blazing um i love that he does lonesome town he does he has a great uh feel for that uh movie mag uh i thought of of george harrison too uh when he did movie make uh, and, and also Ringo too, because you know, they both love uh, Carl Perkins as does he. And um, I love fabulous uh, because I like uh, uh, rockabilly a lot. And it's great to hear that, you know, it's great to hear that song. I wish, I wish I had been at the cavern. I know that uh, I remember that that particular night I had, uh, I got some, uh, I was in touch with somebody that was there. It wasn't you, though, Alan. Um, I, it was somebody that we both, I think, probably both know, know um, who was there, and she gave me all the details of what, what that show was like, and I was just incredibly jealous. I mean, that was just uh, wonderful that he did that. And that, that DVD is great. Jean Catherell? Yes, I was not going <laughs> to mention I wasn't going to mention your name, but Jean, if you're listening, hello. Um, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, it was Gene, and uh, what a great show! I mean, and the DVD—I guess the DVD is out of print now, which is really—that's too bad. Uh, yeah. That's a great. That is a great. Yeah, uh, if you can mm-hmm. find the, the DVD of that uh, on Amazon for a decent price, uh, by all means grab it. It's—it's it's a great show. I mean, that was, and it's great that uh, I haven't seen it in a while. But somebody what yells at him or something, and uh, Paul actually says cusses at him. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Puts, puts his hand on the mic. Do you remember that, Alan? Yeah, yeah. It was it was a it was a wild <laughs> night, really. <laughs> mm-hmm. You how, know, it how, was how packed was that place? I mean, 
oh, it was as packed as it could be. Um, of course, it wasn't the real cavern. It, you know, it was the, it's the place built next door, and it wasn't the you know what you picture as the cavern. If you if you look at the some other guy clip, for instance, it, it's a, a big room next door to that room. But you know, by Paul McCartney standards, not very big at all. And they really had you packed in. And 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 I've got to say, I mean, in a certain way. Watching the DVD probably, apart from the thrill of being there, is probably a somewhat better experience than actually being there was. Um, <laughs> because I'll tell you, you know, you're really packed in, and you're wearing your winter coat because it was at the end of it was December and it was cold, and there were no place to put coats, and um, mm. and it was hot in there, and the floor is not raked in any way. And if you're not immensely tall as I'm not, and you're sort of (laughs) anywhere, not in the front. I mean, it really was a strain to see. Whereas on the DVD, you get a beautiful view of the band. Yes. Um, Hmm. But, you know, I mean, for me, I mean, that trip was, it it was a lot of fun. I mean, um, I I went to the show with Mark Lewis and actually, um, (laughs) And so during the day before it, the, he sort of showed me lots of places in the area. And and because of this show was what it was, um, you're walking down Matthew Street in the middle of the afternoon. And it's almost like being in a real world version of Yellow Submarine or something. You know, you're walking yeah. down the street. <laughs> And you're seeing, uh, you know, Alan Williams walking right past you with someone else. And, you know, and there's the crack and there's, you know, the bar that they used to hang out in and and all this stuff in it. You were just sort of seeing people from their Liverpool days, you know, just sort of there. And wow. Yeah. So so that was fun. And the, and the show was, you know, f- fun to hear, even if you couldn't see very well, uh, you know, and plus, you knew like you weren't in any doubt that you weren't going to have a copy because it was broadcast live. So, you know, by the next morning, you you had the audio of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that was one of the things I remember that uh, that was one of the first times uh, I think that the audio of that show was out on the internet right away. That's mm. right. It, it was, and, I think, an internet broadcast, actually. Was it broadcast? And and I remember seeing um, a CD of that the very next day. Yeah. So, yeah. there was The other thing, and this is where I really could kick myself. Mm. Um, in the afternoon, there was a press conference, and the press conference was held in the – other cavern room that is a facsimile of the cavern as you know we know it from pictures of the beatles Mm -hmm. um and he came out and spoke and you know i recorded that i mean as as you can do as a press person you know i had my recorder with me what i hadn't realized um because the band playing was really kind of tight and they were rehearsing before the press conference in the next room I didn't really know about the next room until that night when that's where they sent us. I I thought the show was going to be in the sort of, you know, vaulted ceiling cavern room. That's what I thought was the cavern. Mm -hmm. So when I heard the band rehearsing, I thought they were playing the record and I did not record it. (laughs) <laughs> so, oh. yes yes I, get, it's, I have to say i shouldn't even be admitting this publicly <laughs> having, having <laughs> once turned up at a, a mccartney <laughs> rehearsal before the 89 tour there was a there was a round table that they did at the lyceum theater with the yep, interview yeah. uh, before the press conference there was a press conference at the lyceum theater yes. where they played but the day before they had a small press round table with maybe a Half, half a dozen reporters. Mm-hmm. And I went to that. And when I was sitting in the Lyceum Theater waiting for the press conference, Paul came out and started playing drums. Then Linda came out and joined them on guitar. And basically the whole band came out, each playing an instrument that was not the instrument they play on stage. Hmm. And they jammed. And it was it was actually quite good. And I'm sitting there with wow. my recorder, and I put it on, and I put my finger over the red light, and I'm just sitting there looking, um, you know, innocent, innocent as I possibly could. <laughs> and his manager, Richard Ogden, um, came up to me and said, you're taking liberties, aren't you? <laughs> I said, 
What? <laughs> and he confiscated my cassette. Oh. I don't have that either. I know some of the other journalists who were there were also taping it, and I've asked the couple for a copy and have never gotten one. But uh, so there are all of these potential things floating around. Someone else at the at the cavern press conference may have taped the the rehearsal. <laughs> But um, and if any and if anyone has the rehearsal, contact Alan Cozen. That's right. <laughs> contact me too. <laughs> yes, yes. We'll, we'll share it around, or or not if you don't want it. <laughs> uh, was Linda actually playing guitar? Yes. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. Ah. Was she just strumming chords? She or, was mostly or strumming chords. I mean, there weren't okay. leads or anything going on, but you know, Paul was drumming, and uh, it was it was really a, it was you know it was sort of like a reggae ish kind of jam, and it was it was really pretty good. I mean, it, it, I don't know that it's something that they would put out, you know, but it was uh, it was more than competent. Let's say that, and oh, also wow. it was just so unusual to see. You know, when do you see Paul drumming live? Wow, unplugged. Okay. <laughs> For ain't, ain't no sunshine, you know. I, I wish you'd do more in of it. the room with him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. So, so how long? How long was this? It probably this... went for five or ten minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and this after I got my cassette this was before... confiscated. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> this was before because the band did four songs. I was there that day. No, this was they this did was four the day songs. before that. Okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah, I was there for for that same the next the next day, not the round table, but the the right. the press conference and and their their performance yeah okay. wow so well, huh. we can we can add that to the the lost paul mccartney performances that's right yeah maybe it'll turn up maybe it will but alan when when you saw this show at the cavern did you kind of wish even though you couldn't see everything did you kind of wish paul would keep this band and, mm. and and go on the road with yeah. it. Yeah, I thought the band was quite good. Uh, although I thought that his his previous touring band was quite good too. So it, I I wasn't necessarily, and you know what, I wasn't thinking in those terms quite in the same way as when I've seen Ringo and the Roundheads and thought he should tour with these guys, um, mm. just because you know the Roundheads were, you know, a tight band, and also Ringo was doing all the singing on those shows. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I didn't think of it quite that way, but I mean, I also, I think felt that there wasn't much possibility that he could tour with them because David Gilmore has plenty to do and, yeah, right, uh, right. you know, so I, I, I sort of knew it would be a one-off or assumed it would be a one-off and, uh, really just thought of it that well, it actually wasn't totally a one-off. Didn't he use some of these guys on the PETA show? Yeah. I, I think, think Gilmore did. was there mm, too. Yes. I think he, I think you're right. So it was a two-off. <laughs> But um, yeah, yeah. The album, uh, I, I enjoyed the album. Um, I reviewed it when it came out and really liked it a lot. And uh, but I think I liked the Russian album more because in this case, Paul was self-consciously making an album to be released, whereas the other one, you're more of a fly on the wall and hearing mm. what he's doing when he's just rocking with some people. Um, I think the the greater looseness on that one kind of appealed to me more. Um, okay. But I like this one a lot, and I like the whole, you know, the cover thing and, uh, you know, the, that, that drugstore in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. You know, there was just something nice and funky about that. And, and uh, any Anytime he does those old old songs, I mean, he's got the voice for it. I mean, he's got one of the best. I'm, I'm not saying this just to, you know, to say it, but I mean, he's got one of the best rock and roll voices there ever was. And and when he does these old songs, he always does a great job. Um, he these songs are made for him, and that's, yes. you know, I, I you know I was really thinking, without going too far off the subject, that um, the um, the standards album would have been would have been just as good and it really wasn't uh this is this is what he was born to do so yeah i have a feeling well, that the standards album might have been quite as good if he had done it maybe the week after this yeah <laughs> you know, exactly. part of part of the problem with the standards album is that um, i think time has taken a little bit of a toll on his voice that mm -hmm. is more evident in standards than it would have been in this stuff and if yeah. he had recorded that stuff earlier that might have been a different situation mm -hmm. yeah I think yeah that's, that's, a good, that's good very point. much the case 
It depends. You know, on Kisses on the Bottom, there are times when he is in his natural voice as opposed to what he calls his littler voice. Mm. And when he does sing, like on My Valentine Mm. or um, Get Yourself Another Fool, his vocals are fine, you know. But um, I guess he he felt with certain songs, I don't know if it might have been the range. Maybe he couldn't hold on to notes as long. I don't know. Unless he actually tries to sing it in his more natural voice, yeah. as opposed to what he did, you wouldn't really know for sure. But um, I think the way the songs were executed on Kisses on the Bottom were fine. The, the band was amazing. Oh, the band was amazing. You know? oh, the yeah, band sure. was fantastic. I mean, yeah. there's no way I'm going to fault Diana Krall. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can point a gun to my head, and I will not fault, <laughs> fault Diana Krall. Right. <laughs> but it's kind of hard to compare an album of 50s rockers to an album of standards. Right. right. You know, it's 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 two completely different genres altogether. The vocal deliveries that Paul's going to give for a rocker like Lucille is going to be much different than what he's going to do on Irving Berlin's Always. Yeah. You know, let's, right. let's although blame... he rocked on Duke Ellington. But, you know, yeah, let's blame Tommy LaPuma. <laughs> yeah. We're not blaming anybody I'm here. I'm joking. Steve. I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Maybe he should have maybe Paul... he should have done a, a version of Don't Get Around Much Anymore in in that style and on kisses on the bottom that would have been that would have been actually interesting i think that's a, mm. that would have been very interesting or summertime very, right yeah. you know i i really wish that with the 50s rockers i i'd welcome another one from paul oh, sure. sure and hear more more songs from his past that he loved that we never got to hear him do but i think i think him Al, sharing that with us but i think al's point about his voice i think is 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 definite i think his his voice has taken a downturn and i'm not and not sure the results would be as as good um but there's more leeway well, we'll you know you can you can sort of shout it and and mm-hmm. uh you know get sure. still get a great effect and you know, I don't know. I think that I think a, a rocker album, he might be able to, um, you know, still still really pull off. Sure. Mm. Cause he's he's, okay. uh, he's, he's still definitely... able he's still able to do Helter Skelter live mm-hmm. yeah. concert very oh, well. Sure. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, you know, I mean, I, although I haven't seen him since Candlestick, but yeah, I mean, he his voice was great that night. Um, so, yeah. But there are there are recordings since where you can tell things have been a little shaky. But you know, you just. But you know, uh, you're dealing with someone who's giving you a two and a half plus hour concert. Oh, I know. I'm not. And I'm not. Falling. And I'm not. I'm not going to deny that there are times when his voice is not what it used to be. But there are plenty of times, and you can even see what people post online of his concerts where his vocals are fine. Mm-hmm. Sure. And if all you have to do is get the right take in the studio, if it mm-hmm. takes a few times to get it, you can pull that off. Sure. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no reason he can't do another album like Run, Double, Run or, or the Russian album. Mm-hmm. And I love when, when uh, you know, the Beatles share this with us, that these are favorites of theirs. Oh, sure. When George tells you he loves Hoagie Carmichael or, uh, you know, with Ringo, it's scattered on his albums, all the songs that he's covered. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd love for Ringo to do a whole album of covers. That would be nice. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I'd love for Paul to do another album of standards. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just another dimension, another side to these people. Where they're showing what their influence are, what their influences are beyond this, sure. <laughs> Be, beyond what we know them for. Sure. So uh, you know, it's part of the whole history of it all. Sure. And there's, I'm sure, there's so much music that these guys loved that we don't even know about. So every single time we get a glimpse of it on an album like Run Devil Run or the Russian album, I I I welcome it. I appreciate these two much more than I ever have. Well, now. I think I think that goes back to all the influences, you know, that we talked about. Was it last week where, you know, the the influences, the music that influenced these guys is so wide ranging, you know, um, it's 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 absolutely incredible. I mean, it's the the bonds are just absolutely, you know, you can't even begin to talk about, uh, you know, you can't limit their influences to one specific thing because they're just so they're so far out. There's so many different fields of music that they uh, that influenced them. So, and that's why they became the diverse band that they that they were, right. and that and that extended into their solo music. Sure, sure. Anyway, okay. So, thanks, guys. That was a, a fun discussion, and I think that will be it for this week. So, uh, all of you out there, feel free to write us Sorry. at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We you can follow us on Twitter or post comments on Twitter. 
Uh, we're at the at symbol things we said fab. And uh, he, got, he got it. He got it. <laughs> I've got it written down on a piece of paper. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> and we all have Facebook pages. Um, and be sure to tune into Steve's examiner columns. Um, keep up with all the news. And uh, we will be back with another show next week. And so for Steve Marinucci, Ken Michaels, and Al Sussman, I'm Alan Cozen. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.